Hi, friends of the sun. Welcome to our weekly reading group happening every Monday. You can join it yourself. All the information is down for in the description for that. And it's like we have a Slack channel and so on. Just a Zoom call. Uh, hop on it. Everyone can do. Uh, everyone can join. And it's allowed to do that. And yeah, we just have an author of a paper usually here discuss their paper with them. And sometimes they present some slides. Sometimes we just scroll through their paper. Yeah, and it would be nice to have you today. We have Amy talking about some um, protein structure sequence. Uh, co-embedding representation learning and we look at some um, discrete quantized representations of these protein structures and sequences and some continuous ones and it's based of like basically the the ESM folds architecture and yeah I think it would be great to have a, a discrete um, embedding of protein structure because then we could have like a language model for example that we just train on these discrete embeddings and then we have a generative model of protein structures that can also compute likelihoods and that would be uh, pretty nice for several applications so let's look at that stuff so let's go yeah uh hello friends of the sun this session will probably be one where we more um like read the paper together so to say you will get the most out of a session like this if you've read the paper before i think because uh, i'll be the asking the questions that i'm curious about right from um when i read the paper and um that's those are the questions that one has if one already has read the paper but we'll also sort of read it together with the help of uh, amy who wrote the paper and um yeah so for that purpose we were like scrolling through this thing and uh taking taking notes in the in in her paper and um if you have questions unmute yourself ask questions don't ask if you can ask a question just ask a question um and uh yeah that's that's basically it then amy do you quickly want to say who you are and then we get into your paper yeah that's good um yeah, thanks for you know having me uh, at the at the journal club it's very fun uh, yeah, so I'm Amy. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student at UC Berkeley. Um, the paper that I'm presenting today is a joint work with Berkeley and with some awesome folks at Prussian Design and Genentech. Um, and yeah, I mean, let's we can get into it. Okay. Well, then, uh, do you quickly want to say the very rough overview of uh, what do we do here? What's the goal? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we wanted to basically look into, uh, first of all, we wanted to see whether or not we can characterize um, a joint latent space of both sequence and structure from the latent space of ESM folds, right? Since, um, since ESM folds, you only need the sequence when it goes in, but you're able to get the entire structure out. Um, you know, we wanted to see whether or not we can basically tease out that latent space. Um, you know, and that would be useful for things like search, for generation, and et cetera. And so while we were sort of investigating this, we found a few other, I guess, interesting tidbits. Um, one being that there's massive activations that uh, where there are some, uh, like, numbers, I guess, in the channels that are just way higher than the others when you take the mean across the channel dimension. Um, and also that you can compress the... Um, the embeddings by quite some quite a lot and still be able to keep the the structure information and to some extent the uh, function information as well. Um, so I, I think a lot of the sort of philosophically a lot of this is driven by how do we tame the latent space and make it useful right like I think we um, talk a lot about alpha fold and ESM folds being sort of like a foundation model moment for uh, for biology, but you know, in its native form as prediction models, you still can't use it to do you know, generation, for example, um, unless you kind of tweak certain aspects, right? Um, okay. Then, so we we want to generate a joint latent space of sequence and structure that we can then maybe use later on also for uh, also proteins, right? Uh, that we can then later on maybe use for um, all sorts of tasks, maybe some downstream prediction tasks, maybe some uh, protein structure or protein generation in general. And um, yeah, then that's, uh, okay, now I kind of wanted to ask you, okay, we want to learn this joint, uh, joint space. Uh, what is the motivation for it? But now I kind of already uh, set the motivation for it as well. Um, yeah. Any other motivations that come to mind? We want to generate proteins and we want to 
um, yeah, do do predictions on top of that latent space? Yeah, I mean, I think the ideal case is sort of like you know, once you give the writing to the reader, then the needing it up for the reader to interpret in the sense of like, you know, you can take these embeddings and do whatever it is that you want with it. Um, I think some examples that we can think of is generation. Um, another one is search. Like the tokenized version of this is in a lot of ways the same as the 3DI tokens in VoteSeq, right? Um, but, you know, you can imagine a bunch of other things. Like, honestly, I mean, even if you just want to store really compact representations of embeddings, like say you have a collaborator uh, and you want to just email them, like, a spreadsheet of numbers right like that would be a way of doing it since you can just yeah it's a if you get you use like let's say the the 16 number compression right you can literally get that in a csv file and it's just like a compressed version um of the data so yeah i mean in, in short i think there's quite a bit of different things you can do if you're a little bit creative about it um but i think the um, sort of the main ones that we were anchoring our thinkings around were you know search generation representation learning um, those are the main three ones that we were right. thinking of. Search. Uh, search as well. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, let's maybe say right in the end, the representation that you will be generating, you wanted to capture some structure, but the inputs that you give to the model to to get a, like an embedding is only a sequence. You don't right. need, to, you're not embedding a structure. You're only embedding a sequence, but into a space. Uh, that captures the structure and the sequence. Okay, so that's sort of the goal. Then, uh, and yeah, you call your uh, may maybe first say, um, like this the the cheap, uh, cheap thing and HPCT thing. And cheap is the what is cheap and what is HPCT? Oh. Right. The uh, HPCT is the auto encoder architecture that we that we named and cheap is sort of the series of embeddings um, that uh, are essentially derived from like a compression of the latent space. And, but, you know, you can think of it as like, yeah, compressed um, embedding of sequence and structure. Okay, then let's get into how you do it because I think uh, maybe one way to, to sort of structure the paper is that you first uh, look at the ESM fold and what its embeddings look like because, right, we could also um, no. you look at this thing, what its embeddings look like, and then you sort of change um, how you do things. Because we can, uh, we already have sort of one uh, latent space that we could go and use, right? We have ESM fold. So um, this uh, thing here, I guess, should represent ESM fold. Is that right? Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, we could just, just add inference time. Maybe that's one keynote to add um, at okay. inference time. Okay, so and then we could just go ahead and take this X here as our latent representation. And exactly. now yeah. you sort of look at that X um, and um, say some bad things or say, say some things about it. Okay, then do you want to explain to us what's, uh, what's going on or how does ESM fold work and why is this as ESM fold only at inference time? Yeah, so ES Unfold, um, you know, it's like for yeah, for those on the call who maybe are uh has been a while since they read the paper, it's sort of a um a follow-up to AlphaFold in some ways, where the initial search trunk is replaced by a protein language model. Um, and then uh, you you know take the embedding of that of the language model embedding and then train a structure module on top of it. Um and the reason why I wanted to highlight that is that inference time is that. Um, kind of one of the origin points of this project is looking in the ESM fold code and finding that at inference time, the Z, the pairwise information is initialized um, as zeros. So in alpha fold, that was in, in the original alpha paper, that was context, right? And we also know that ESM2 in previous literature, people have shown that the attention patterns capture certain contexts. Um, but yeah, no, I just thought it was really interesting that at inference time, you actually, you know, just kind of can put in the the context right as zeros. Um, and it, it's kind of surprising and unsurprising at the same time because, you know, once uh, well, actually you put it in, it it becomes, you know, it, it's like after the initial layer, the output of the first layer now, the, the Z is actual numbers and not just zeros. So in a way you can maybe even think of it as the model is, is implicitly distilling information from that X um, into the contact, uh, pairwise contact array, but um, to okay. use 
maybe uh, let's so so what does does this decoder here so to say look like right it it'll also be the decoder later in in your network i suppose um and in alpha fold we had this thing of we have a sequence representation we have a pair representation maybe the pair representation is initialized from some contacts or some other knowledge that you have and then you um yeah you update the sequence and the pair representation iteratively uh by and you like this thing here um in, in alpha fold this the structure module it starts from like a cloud of frames that's uh, all put to zero 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 and frames are like just have a position and a rotation and they're just initialized to the same point and then uh, they're sort of uh, iteratively updated over the layers of this of the structure module here and then blown up into the protein structure and right. basically uh, most of the computation goes on in the um, alpha folds uh, what do they call it evo former like in in this part yeah. just more or less a transformer spits out a sequence representation um, and a pair representation actually right it spits out the sequence and a pair representation and then updates it in this um yeah i updates it in this structure module and then um yeah i guess you end up with your structure so now how is this structure module different from the alpha fold uh, from from what i just said uh, it also takes in a pair representation and updates it but here this pair representation is a a very simple one and doesn't come from the, the language model. And I guess then in here, you also have some more expensive operations, um, more expensive than what you have in alpha in the alpha for structure module, is that right? Um, yeah, I think I think they just, um, the architecture is the same as the, oh. um, the open full one, at least. Okay. Yeah, so so, actually in the code, you just import the open fold structure trunk. Very nice. So it's yeah. basically like really this sequence uh, representation carries a lot of information. Um, and maybe that's why you said it's surprising, right? That these can or the pair representations can be initialized to zeros and the stuff still works so well. Okay. And then this is like now a latent space, right? From which we yeah. know that it captures the structure quite well because we can go ahead and throw this decoder on top of it and obtain the structure from it. Yes. Um, so now then let's maybe get into, um, yeah, let's maybe then first say, you now throw your the, the sequence code decoder on top of it to make sure that this latent space also, or the, the, the latent space here, it also captures sequence and not only structure, but, uh, that, that's maybe the, the simple thing, but you also look at um, right some properties of this X. And for the properties of this X, where should we go in the paper? Or what do you want to say about those? Um, no, I mean, that's a, yeah, it's a great summary. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, <laughs> nothing to add. <laughs> okay, but then what, is, what do you say about the X? What are the pathologies of, of it if we just go with the ESM? Um, ASM fold model. Right. Yeah. Well, the well, the first thing that we noticed when we we're like handling that that embedding that um, the the latent embedding at that bottleneck X is we noticed that um, uh, there were just if you take the mean of every single channel, there were certain channels that just had really high means, um, and while we were sort of playing around with how to normalize this. Um, there was concurrent literature that was published in the LLM worlds that saw that in Llama and actually just pretty much a lot of large transformers out there all suffer from the same, um, the same pathology, right? Um, and so you see in figure, figure A, um, you see that there's uh, along the hidden dimensions, right? Most of the values are, you know, somewhat the some somewhat the same, but then you have some values that are just extremely high. Um, you can see that in figure B. So the gray line is the median uh, activation of, you know, in that entire sort of um, X, quote unquote. Um, and then the other three lines are the top three values. And so you can see they're much, much higher, right, than the median, than the median value. Um, and Wait a second. So are we now looking here at, um, do we, we take our model 
we throw in a protein, right? And then we get this X. Um, yes. X of, like, is it, by the way, 1,024? Yes, yeah, at that point. Well, um, yes, although for A, we actually examine several different, like, embeddings, essentially, that have different dimensions. So we wanted to see whether or not this was mm -hmm. just a problem with that specific layer or if it's a problem, like, you know, throughout. Um, and so X, yes, does have 1,024, but the fine print is in the specific diagram that we're looking at. It actually might have different uh, different values, different dimension sizes. Okay. Uh, and then if the, the values that we're looking at here in this plot, are they for the original ESM fold model or are they already for the cheap sort of say, continuous cheap version where we have the sequence decoder on top of it? These are for the original model. Okay, so we're just looking at original alpha uh, ESM fold. And uh, now in this X, we throw in a single protein and then we like look at all the channels. We let's order them by magnitude. And then we see one or like the top three, they get much larger. Uh, um, like here, we also have a number of layers on the X axis, I guess. And so then in the last layer, like the actual X that we were looking at before, like the, the X up here, uh, this X guy, if we look at him, um, oh, why uh, at them, then we have the three are much, much larger than like maybe here are a few in between, but here is the, the 50, uh, the, the half largest, so to say, the, the median. Yeah, why am I using stupid words? Just to... <laughs> That's um, actually a good way of thinking about the, the concept of median. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and then sure we okay. And now is this like always the same channel, no matter what protein I put in? Yes, exactly. It's the same channel, no matter what you put in, no matter what data. We looked at the stats across a bunch of data sets like CAF and then you know ref and etc. And it's always yeah. the same, same ones. And Ernest is also already asking something in chat that I was wondering was like don't we do any layer normalization or stuff similar to that uh, that will get rid of this? Why you know, why, or can't we do something like that uh, to get rid of it? Why yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll answer two parts. Um, so, so yeah, so um, we do actually in one of the later sections describe how we normalize it. And in our embeddings, we actually do always normalize it by the channel statistics. So we basically calculate the channel um means and um yeah for for cath and then basically normalized by those statistics in, in our experiments the reason why it exists in the original um transformer and i think yeah i, I feel like this this theme has come up a few times where you're like well don't we use layer norm in transformer training so like why does this even happen um it's because the the way that trans the layer norm is usually used in transformers it's usually the the, ver the version where you don't adjust for every channel individually so that is to say if like a channel already has a really like has an imbalance value it doesn't get adjusted by the per channel statistics so it basically just gets reached centered but still in its it gets reached centered by the layer output but not by like the per channel okay value. so we have like uh, let's say this is our x vector and this is the l dimension um and then this is the channel yeah uh, this is the what letter do you use for it do you use d or c or uh, i think i use c if i remember correctly okay and then um we like we normalize across um all values in like we take the average across l and then uh, remove that mean and that standard deviation is that right yeah, well, so imagine if you have more dimensions along C, right? So let's just imagine right now this diagram we're looking at, there's one channel dimension, but then if you, and so when in the, like, and let's say you have a few more layer dimensions, right? Uh, sorry, a few more channel dimensions. Um, in the classic one, you just take the mean across that entire tensor, whereas in, um, and, and that's why you get these big values, because some channels already have really wacky values, right? In order to correct for it, you would need to take the mean of every single channel individually, which okay. is not what's done in transform large transformer training like you know like so we don't take the mean across the channel 
we don't uh, across the across the like data dimension we don't take the mean across the channel either we take the mean across the channel and the um the data dimension um like uh, we yes. just take yes. every single yes. value in this guy and take yes. the mean across it instead of uh, let's maybe draw two channels here uh, instead of taking the mean across only um, across only the yeah exactly yeah instead of only across the black column here um okay so and then you say um now when you create your latency you take the mean across the um across this guy here mm -hmm. yeah good but then um yeah if we do that is everything fixed if we just right we have our uh auto encoder here then let's just um so remove him and uh, we just like take a thousand proteins we embed them and we get like a list of values here and the list yeah. of uh, a list of values by which we need to normalize and then we have our x um x bar or so and then the list of values here that are like one over the one over the yellow values then um yeah that's it and now this guy here this x x dash no x bar should mm -hmm. work well because we no longer have these exploding values right won't that suffice yeah 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 exactly oh, i what do you mean uh, like then why do we need cheap if that suffice yeah. oh. oh sorry when you um well i think that um um well so the reason why we included this in the paper is this is actually kind of one of the guiding principles for why we did the rest of the paper because um the goal isn't just to correct for it per se, right? Um, it, massive activations do have certain implications, like for example, you know, it might affect your training dynamics and such. But for our purposes, it was more so that it made it very difficult to um, to tame. And also, when we were exploring this phenomenon, we noticed that if we get rid of the three outliers, then structure prediction completely collapses. So that's what we're visualizing in uh, figures C to E, that when you get rid of the the outliers. Um, it, it it's just like the, the, these three channels out of 1,024 seems to hold extraordinary weight in terms of how the structure information is is sort of like parsed through the network. And if you get rid of them, then you don't have a structure anymore. So that means that the structure... Yeah, then maybe let's first say, what are we looking at in, in figure E? Like, well, yeah. how do you construct this guy with outliers removed? Oh, okay, no, maybe. Okay, I can see here the yeah. y-axis is the TM score. So how good exactly. are we at recovering or at, how good are we at predicting the structure, right? Because we're actually still predicting. We have only our sequences input. Um, and one is perfect. And I guess we are we evaluating on the training set here because these are some very good values. Uh, uh no i mean we just i just should took um oh sorry these are tm scores to the um the originally predicted structure yeah ah okay so to the original predicted structure not to the pdb structure good mm -hmm. so how well do we preserve the original structure which we is usually a good prediction and now this is with outliers removed what does it outliers removed mean yes yeah, so if you scroll over to c uh paint panel c um so the top half of panel C is if you take the histogram of the channel means without doing anything to them. So you'll notice that most of them fall sort of along the middle, but then you have a few outlier values. Um, and if we get rid of those outlier values, that's what we mean by outlier removes. So that's the green, oh, right? Okay. So the purple is without doing anything across all three channels. Purple means, you know, we haven't done anything to it yet. Um, we don't get rid of the outliers. And then green means we did get rid of the outliers. And so you see both qualitatively and quantitatively in panel D, you see qualitatively that the structures are really terrible. <laughs> the green structures are not structures. Um, and yeah. the uh, values in E, uh, you know, are like qual qualitatively, you see the same phenomenon. Okay, so with the outliers removed, we get these structure predictions. Yeah. And of course, very bad. 
Yeah, then uh, if we look at the structures predictions, we don't even need to look at stuff like this. Okay, yeah. um, but then let me like one thought that I had right is what we care about here in is maybe not the uh, the magnitude in the channel um, or like for the quality of the structure prediction or it matters how much information is carried by the channel right yeah. so maybe it's less the magnitude of the channel that matters but the magnitudes um, the, the people call it signal to noise ratio i guess right exactly magnitude of the channel divided by the variance of the channel if i take a thousand proteins um like i take my thousand proteins i embed them to get a thousand embedding vectors and then i look at uh, what is the average um the, the the size of the like in this in this channel right here what is the the average magnitude um and what is the standard deviation across all of these embeddings and then um yeah if the standard deviation is also very large then there's not much more information carried by uh yeah the yeah then there's not much more information carried by this channel than by the other channels yeah. which yeah. because maybe the other channels the the magnitude is much smaller, mm -hmm. but the standard deviation also is much smaller. Um, so did you look at the signal to noise ratio of these channels as well? Um, so can you redefine signal again? Uh, this is just the, the magnitude. The, so the average magnitude of the channel. Oh, the average magnitude. Uh, yeah, the average magnitude is a lot. I, I guess you can kind of infer from the histogram, like figure C. To I some mean, the, the average magnitude is what you're looking at here, right? So this is the average magnitude of the channel. Um, or so if you're maybe only looking at a single protein here, then it's just the average across one protein. Yeah. So yeah. Channel. So uh, yes, panel B, that is the case that you're just looking at one protein. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if maybe I didn't, didn't understand the question correctly, but yeah, like if you take the kind of if you go back to panel C, if you take the mean, then you know it's um, a skewed mean because you it's biased by the really large values that are completely different orders of magnitude um, higher. No, and like, in terms sorry. of signal to noise from like a structural from an information content sense, that's sort of what the rest of the paper is exploring, right? Like, what are we looking at in C here? Is this uh, a single protein or are these averages across many proteins? Ah, averages across many proteins. Okay. So then we have here, is this one channel? Um, uh, yeah, here's this one channel, which has like this very high. Um, so now we took the average across many proteins for this one channel. And yeah. we see this has a high magnitude. Yeah. But now, if we uh, take the same channels and we calculate the uh, variance across uh, many proteins, then will be the same channel that has a very high variance. Ah, uh, I see what but you mean. Then the signal to noise ratio of all the channels actually still is the same, and the information that's carried by each channel is the same. And probably we will find that um, we will find that all the channels have a somewhat similar standard deviation mm, I see while yeah. the signal remains very high because we do see this behavior that if we just remove these few channels then uh, everything goes to shit yeah that's a great point yeah i think i don't think i've explicitly looked at that but my yeah I, I should just go back and run that experiment but my hunch would be that yeah i think you're right the um the statistics would be um would be compared. actually you know I, I don't want to say it out of like, yeah. <laughs> without having done the uh done the thing but uh, um, i mean that's just right if we look at the vaes then that's usually the the thing that's important in the latent space if we think about which channel carries information it's not the signal right. uh, like not just the magnitude but the signal to noise ratio but right. now we have in the in the chat the question of why don't we use layer norm um, and won't layer norm fix this? Uh, we, we thought about this before. And so layer norm, I don't know, is or isn't used here, but layer norm directly wouldn't fix this uh, because layer norm 
here if we uh, we say this whole thing here is our representation this is the channel dimension this is the the data dimension then a layer norm or what layer norm would do is to take the uh, to to normalize across every single number in here and yes. what we uh, instead want to do is to normalize only across the pink thing here um yes. yeah anyway this is also then what amy does when she um when she ch generates her cheap representation he representations here is to do this normalization across the channel dimension but then i would say we sufficiently looked at the um uh, at the esm fault representations let's look at your cheap representations how do you obtain them i see you have this um like, yeah let's maybe look at b for this how do you obtain them i see you have this uh, esm faults uh, language model at the beginning you keep it you keep the structure model and you keep the weights here frozen actually mm -hmm. uh, while only fine-tuning this guy anything uh, that you want to say about why this is the case why do you keep them frozen have you also tried not keeping them frozen stuff like that um so yeah actually the the linear combination anything that is blue is frozen so the only thing that we trained is the sequence decoder and uh, that's trained once, and then after that, it's kept frozen. Um, so what we what we train is our like uh, HCPT model, so our autoencoder. That's basically trained. We basically save these two disks. Like we grab these the, these purple embeddings, grab them out, save them, and then train start again, train a model from those saved embeddings from disk. Um, yeah, I think fine tuning it would fine tuning the entire thing would definitely be the way to do it. Uh, it's just yeah, computational resources. And, okay, so. What you do is actually you um you just save these um let's maybe put them put this away you just save many of these in um in your pre computation or whatever you want to call it uh, yeah. you save them and then this cheap uh, is just or the HPCT HCTP or whatever it mm -hmm. uh, is a auto encoder that just auto encodes this X well yeah. it encodes this X almost it just encodes this X now normalized across channels exactly. um, yeah. and exactly. also from the you train something that um, right here in this step we might be losing some sequence information like this uh, in the middle um doesn't necessarily capture a sequence anymore and now you train the sequence decoder to make sure sort of that the thing in the middle captures sequence but actually like if we don't train uh, this guy if we keep it frozen then we don't ensure this right um it could be that this guy doesn't capture the sequence uh, anymore at all or doesn't you cannot recover the sequence in your latent space? This could be the case, but uh, we can just look at your experiment, uh, experiments and can see that this is not actually a concern, and that um, yeah, at least these representations still capture the sequence in some fashion. If we just look at uh, your your accuracies, I don't know. Um, ah, am I getting ahead of myself? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. This sequence reconstruction stuff is basically always um, a uh, hundred percent accuracy in in reconstruction. Okay, but let's let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Um, yeah. So, and you're saying right? You you agree with me sort of that this guy should also be fine tuned and this guy should also be fine tuned and then yeah. we would probably get better representations here but that would that be would be my dream if anyone wants to do that like let me know <laughs> i i wanted to do that but it's just one of those things where you know you have to remember these models are also very large right so it's just mm -hmm. uh, easier to train a different model on top of it yeah. well then i mean seriously let's see uh, if anyone in the chat wants to do it then reach out to to Amy, right? Because this would certainly give rise to better representations, and yeah. then uh, and right, there are two things that we do here with these cheap representations. Um, the the VA or the the VAE here in the middle 
or the, the autoencoder here in the middle that then produces the latent representations um, or the compressed latent representations of this of the X up here. Uh, this autoencoder, it uh, we can make it a v VAE just that has a continuous representation, or we can make it a VQ VAE that has a like tokenized discrete representation. And I would say maybe foreshadowing the results a little bit, the reconstructions with the VQ VAE they are kind of worse than the continuous ones. And this is a little bit sad because if we have a discrete, uh, like a discrete tokenization of proteins, then that's very cool, I think. And or the, a discrete latent space of structure and sequence, that's very cool because then we have like um, this discrete structure representation, right? And now a tokenized structure representation. And then we can just train language models to generate this. Uh, latent representation and if we have such a language model then we can also uh, now do something like dpo directly on it instead of doing dpo on like a structure generative model like rf diffusion mm -hmm. like a diffusion model where we then need to use dpo for um where we use dpo for diffusion models which sort of is very finicky and maybe also just doesn't work uh, at all or doesn't give many benefits. No, here we then could directly use uh, preference optimization and optimize for like the, the structure or the sequence structure generative model can optimize it for experimental success in your um, binding assay or to optimize it to generate structures that have high enzymatic activity for this and that reaction for which you have a little bit of experimental data. So like having a good uh, discrete representation of sequence and structure would be very, very cool. And now we find, um, yeah, the discrete, rep uh, the discrete representation of protein and sequ uh, structure and sequence that we get here, it's kind of not so good. It's not as good as we would like or not as good to the uh, good enough to the level that we would be like yeah let's just train our language model on it and then we're happy um, and maybe that is because we are not fine-tuning these two guys and if we were to fine-tune these two guys then we would get a super good discrete representation as well so yeah. if anyone in the chat is interested in a super good discrete representation as well then uh, go ahead and chat with Amy um, yeah yeah yeah, no, that that yeah, these are all yeah amazing points and yeah, like it's very very spot on. Well, um, the, some of the things that we were thinking about too. I'll just add one thing where it's just yeah, like the fact that the discrete representation works worse than the compressed one is to be expected since you're strictly throwing away information when you're discretizing, right? Um, but uh, the like to some extent, it's possible that the quantized like how do I say this? Like the structures themselves already have a lot of noise and a lot of error. Right. So um, in some ways, maybe what you should be uh, assessing if you want to use the discrete tokens for whatever downstream task is maybe not whether or not it corresponds to the original input, but like, is it, does it reconstruct to a feasible input? Right. Because it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 a po it's a possibility that actually the quantization just got rid of some of the experimental like error, like it's like it could have been anywhere between here, but then because it's it's because it's token it's tokenized, then you can sort of get rid of that, um, like that noise to some degree. Um, so yeah, I'll add that. Um, yeah. Then, but then, like, let's get to how does your VAE here in the middle actually work, right? So we have this, um, we have this model here, which produces us our embeddings. And then we have this x, this x here, um, x. And now we throw it into some VAE or some autoencoder, get some latent representation. I think you'll call it z, correct me if I'm wrong. And then we get out our uh, x again, or our x hat. And we, we have some loss, bit, some reconstruction loss between these guys. And we have some uh, loss on the latent space to to have it uh, still be uh, nice and smooth. Okay, and then this latent space should also be compressed somehow in, in size. Let's talk about how this guy works, this autoencoder. Um, and for that, let's maybe scroll to this. I guess you have nice visualization here as well. 
um where uh, no let's not look at it um two, 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 discussion methods per channel right here we have this normalization that we talked about per channel because we actually throw our x into this normalization to end up with our x dash so this x here gets normalized to the x dash and then we throw this guy um into the autoencoder yeah i don't know what i'm drawing here uh, yeah, yeah and i think there's a comment in the chat about previously about why we didn't just use channel norm and in, in a sense this basically is channel norm yeah. but it's yeah um okay but then our glass compression transformer right so the, this i guess is now your your autoencoder right. uh, this is supposed to be this guy and in this uh, our class compression transformer i suppose we have the the two interesting tidbits here of um this guy like do we quantize or not what's happening here and then we have this linear down sampling stuff right because what we could do is we have our representation here um why did it change color i don't know uh, this mm -hmm. this representation uh, and we uh, throw it into our autoencoder and it has c like it has some channels um and it has some some length dimension do you call it l or n uh, you call it l, l uh, yeah. some length dimension and then we could turn it into a compressed z um the, the compressed z which has maybe now c over 2 so it's a little bit smaller, um, but it still has, or yeah, probably this will be more like um, 16 or something like that. So it's, it's, it's much smaller. Now, instead of this being 1,024, um, instead of this being 1,024, this is now maybe, uh, I don't know, 32. And then this still is the L. But what you actually do is that you turn um, the 1024, I don't know, into 32. Oh no, let's let's already get into the numbers. What concretely is now a plausible uh, channel size in, in your Z? Yeah, it depends on what you want to do. Um, 32 seems actually quite good, um, but yeah, it really depends on what you're, what you're after. Okay, so you do have some experiments where 32, I assume. Um, yeah, oh. for I think for structure, if you just if you're just after structure, thirty two actually seems quite decent. Uh, for function, it's a bit more variable. Okay, so with that mean that you mean if you take the set to re reconstruct your structure, then thirty two is kind of good. But if you um, use the set to then train like some downstream predictor on top of it, mm -hmm. uh, on top of it to predict stability um then you probably have something bigger here or maybe you keep it um maybe this is 512 and we will look at the plots later on it doesn't matter um but then you also change the l and you change it to maybe l over four or so and now like maybe if your protein is 137 um uh, 137 residues long then how, okay, now let's put this up here, 137. Then how long will your uh, thing be down here? If our downsampling factor, like this downsampling factor S, uh, let's say it is four, then if it's 137, what will the L down here be? Or L over S? Like, I mean, it can't literally be L over S, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would be 69 i think like the the ceiling of the um uh of the length divided by the shortening factor okay so then the s now i think in what you said wasn't four but it was two uh, oh yeah yeah sorry yeah so s that. is two and then it would be the ceiling of it 69 um okay and then yeah let's maybe just look at this how, how does it work right this linear downsampling is basically i have my uh let's say 
this is an eight times uh no let's say this is a this is a oh no let's first say this is an eight times two vector and then in this linear downsampling you do this reshaping here and let's say s is two so we want to um half it we want to turn it into eight over two and then how you do it is you stick them together by reshaping them so to say you take this guy and this guy so these two and put them here and here so this is now a four um yeah i guess a four by four vector then you throw it into your linear layer here this linear layer of the size um four by four to two and then you again have a now a two by four vector so this guy two by eight got turned into two by four um mm -hmm. so and you you explain this with like this reshape operation here that turns um, yeah that reshapes the the guy i suppose okay. um and <laughs> what if the what if the reshape doesn't work so what if i i have a nine here right uh you will pat it pat it to oh, the okay. so you actually just pat zeros here at the end yeah okay so you literally but, mm -hmm. well the, the, there's also a mask so both the mask and the um the number or like the actual value gets padded so that you can actually do the reshaping um and then yeah which is which is why earlier i said the the effective length will be the ceiling because uh, so uh, yeah like how do i do this say your remainder was one and then you pad three more zeros to make it a multiple of four uh then after the reshape, um, you that that mask at that position will be one for yeah. that four tokens there. Okay, so then here will be a few tokens, or these guys here will be to lumped together with a few mask tokens and put uh, above each other, and then you throw this into the MLP, and then get your downsampled output out of it. This is kind mm -hmm. of ugly, right? We throw mask values and padding values into our uh, MLP. Um, any comments? Oh, uh, yeah, well, in your MLP, you usually do a mean pool anyway, at least in the, in the ones that we have, in the function experiments that we do. And so you're not necessarily putting the masks into the MLP because you're just you're averaging over the length dimension as well. Uh, not sure what you mean. I mean, we have uh, in this if we're just talking about this linear downsampling thing, there's no pooling or so going on. We are s stacking here a mask on top of a or below an actual representation, and then we throw it into an MLP. And it spits out um, like oh, a, okay. another vector. Okay, sorry, you're talking about MLP during the uh, attention. I see, I see. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, yeah, I think what we're doing here is effectively like, um, yeah, like stride and com filter both equal to s is essentially what this is. Yeah. Um, and, and this and is also a response to the question in the chat. Um, so yeah, so you probably you you probably could. I I just I just didn't really want to. Well, yeah, philosophical. Uh, yeah, wait, that's not not so important. I think right, it's just a a little thing to to have in mind, and we uh we know the stuff sort of works. Um, anyway, then let's talk about the the second part. That's maybe to consider. Right, you do this length um downsampling as well next to the channel downsampling. And now the quantization. Um, how does that stuff work? I guess we probably all know VQVAEs, um, or most of us know VQVAEs. So, but I don't know this FSQ uh, thing. So I would say I explain the VQVAE, and then you explain the FSQ to me, mm -hmm. uh, because you sort of have two versions of uh, quantized autoencoders, I suppose, um, and. So in our VQVAE, what do we have? 
uh, we have this this code book here um like yeah just um a code book of i don't know randomly initialized vectors how do you initialize them before training oh uh it's um it's a good question anyway it doesn't matter then look at the vq vae paper if you want to know it um and then we have our um yeah we so we have this th this code book and um I, I don't know why you write the z equals a set i thought i thought later on z is the latent representation maybe i don't understand the notation quite here but doesn't matter so we, we have this code book uh, of e1s and so on um and they're randomly initialized and right so you now have these discrete number of possibilities you can only have these um i don't know if c is uh, if c is 124 then you only have 124 possible tokens for every vector uh, for every position for every no for every um l because it no longer corresponds to just residues right because we also did down sampling across the the length dimension and mm -hmm. then after we uh, we did that we just have this now or we have our encoder we have our continuous representations and then we just do a k nearest neighbor like we basically look up the closest uh the closest of our um, code books or of our codes and then this is what we assign to the position in our um in our vae and then we have our decoder from which we try to reconstruct here i guess you call it hq uh, from which we try to reconstruct the x and then you have like some reconst for training you have some reconstruction loss and then you also have some loss to train the encoder to make sure that it encodes um, its its outputs close to the the the, the codes that make sense um, and then you have some loss on the codes as well on the codes themselves such that they are like nicely distributed in this latent space and they uh, have low uh, yeah and they can be actually used for representing our structures and for representing our sequence okay that's fine and i guess in your vqvae this part here this reconstruction part is made up half out of a sequence loss and half out of a structure loss okay um correct me if i said anything wrong and otherwise uh let's see how does this uh fsq thing here work we first um have our encoder again which gives us some latents these latents are continuous we throw them through this ton h so this z now is still this continuous vector uh, but every single value is between uh, one and uh, minus one and one and then uh, this, this is complicated what's happening here oh yeah it, fsq is essentially just like you're basically clamping the values to one discrete value um clamping the values to one discrete value so we um we multiply these these values that we've previously normalized to be between minus one and one mm -hmm. we multiply them with l over two so basically we now the the total possible range is um of our values is l over two minus l over two so we have l possible values that this um yeah l possible values that this guy could take on um and no that each channel of this guy could take on mm -hmm. okay and then you still just take the what do you call it the straight through estimator for getting your gradings yeah and do you have some loss on the latent space as well right because here you have this uh, sort of loss for learning your code book and 
do you here have some latent space loss or do you literally just have the reconstruction loss for this FSQ stuff? You just reconstruct it. That's kind of the, the beauty of this method. Um, so there's no parameters in the quantization step, unlike in BQDAE. Okay, so, and the argument why this still works is because we sort of have this well distributed latent. Yeah, I don't know. This is kind of curious. Then it sounds to me like the VAE should also work if we have no, um, if we don't have these losses here. If we remove them, then the VQVAE should also still work. No, it's, I think it has to do with the fact that you're not actually doing a, there's no such, there's no concept of like a code book embedding per se. So there's, there's no, it's not a nearest neighbor search. And so that's why it kind of makes sense why in, for larger code books, FSQ works better because for larger code books, that's when you have a go, like your, the, your number of choices in VQVA is very, very high, right? So, and that's where things can just collapse and it gets harder and harder. Um, for the lower dimensions, VQVA does work better than FSQ. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that the one of the challenges with VQVAE is that, you know, you have to stabilize it with these two additional terms that was in the original paper, but then also sometimes other terms. And, you know, it's just that training that, especially our larger code books, right? If you're trying to train a nearest neighbor, um, you know, your um, classifier and your, there's a bunch of different options to choose from, then that training is much more difficult. And so at that point, you may as well just quantize it, just like, you know, literally just because if you take like the range from negative one to one and split it into like 60k bins, right, that's still quite a lot of bins. Um, and I think FSQ originates from image compression literature and, uh, you know, like the idea of, you know, compressing images, which are continuous to bits. Um, and so that's sort of where where that where that came from. This is like a previously published paper um, that's... Yeah. Yeah, okay. I have to ask the original authors for more intuition on it, but that was the intuition that I got out of it. Yeah. Anyway, then let's look at the at the results. Let, let's look at your figures. Um, first, this one reconstruction. Um, I would say I quickly describe what we see here, and then you say if there's anything left to say about the stuff that you that you want to say. So here we look at only results of the uh, the quantized autoencoders and we do this fsq stuff that you talked about and we do the standard fsq uh, vq vae to get our continuous um our discrete latents and we just see yeah basically the fsq stuff works better and that's about it um because for larger code books. huh for larger code books yeah, I I mean for the smaller code books it's also basically about as good as our um it's about as good as the the other model. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah, one thing to add is if you um, just like a neat neat tidbit is if you look at the original FSQ paper, they have an experiment that the exact same plot basically with um images comparing FSQ and VQVAE and the pattern is almost identical, which is kind okay. of cool. Just wanted yeah. So I I, yeah, this, I think this is more intrinsic to the method than it is to the modality. Yeah, but then the other thing, this TM score, is it the TM score to the protein sequence or is it the TM score to the ESM fold predicted structure? ESM fold predicted. Okay, then I would say this is kind of bad, right? We don't want values like this, like this, like this. We would really like to all values to be uh, up here. And um, to be, or at least I would like them all to be there for me to be confident enough to use mm -hmm. the latent space to train like a language model on top of it um, to then do DPO on top of the language model or so. And yeah, maybe this is something that can be done by also fine tuning the, the encoder and decoder uh, by fine tuning also the, the ESM fold part of the... Right. Uh, encoder and decoder that goes from right. sequence to structure right. okay um yeah that would be cool if if that's done as well because we can look at what the results look like for continuous latents and there we see that the tm score it basically always remains very good until 
um, let's say eight until we have eight, um, eight latents, there it starts to, to, to deteriorate. By the way, what is here the, um, uh, what is here the L of the, <clears throat> or what's our downsampling factor here? What is our S? Uh, um, so the dark green is no downsampling and then the light green is two X uh, downsampling by two, like okay. shortening, I guess, by two. Shortening, yeah. And I guess, uh, again, here, the behavior is that for eight, it starts to, de to deteriorate. So we can sort of say that um, right in principle, we would only need, um, oh yeah, let's, let's look at the green thing. Because in the green thing, uh, our protein structure sort of is of dimensionality. If we just look at the ambient space, it's of dimensionality three, by L. Like for every alpha carbon, we have three coordinates and our L, um, yeah, we have three coordinates and the L additionally capture, ha, ah, this is, this is kind of cool, um, right? We have three, uh, three coordinates and we have the residue type. So let's say I would guess that you sort of need four, would have to need four channels. You need a four by L embedding. And yeah, with four by L, you actually do kind of bad. But right, four by L is not even a compression of the three uh, of the protein. Um, still, it's not enough to represent the protein. And we, in, in our models, we still have like a latent space that is higher dimensional than the data space, so to say. What do you say about that? Um, that's an actually interesting, that's an interesting line of thinking. Um, maybe one thing is that these, um, there's three atoms, yes, but then these three atoms also have but three. No, not three units. atoms. There's one atom and the atom has three coordinates. One C alpha and uh, it has three coordinates, three D. Right. right. Uh, Okay, I see what you mean. Um, and then there's a residue type. So yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we say if it's uh, one additional dimension, so four by L. Well, um, yeah, that's an interesting. Yeah, it's, so yeah, I think it's possible that there that could be a theoretical lower limit, but TM score is. Um, is TM score only looking at C alphas? This is like a question then. Um, is so also looking at the other carbons as well. With TM score, you only evaluate uh, backbone. Right, but then there's also like C beta, right? Like the carbon, the beta yeah. carbon and everything else. So if you include the, the beta carbon, now there's like six. Um, and then that's com completely like ignoring, um, uh, you know, completely ignoring all the other atoms and the side chains and stuff. So which have like interaction. So yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's an interesting point you bring up. Um, I, I just think like we're not really doing any compression or not much compression at all here, right? Compared to, um, compared to images where we really reduce the dimensionality of the data a lot. Uh, but maybe this is sort of also a property of proteins, right? That there is not, uh, while in images you have much sort of high frequency information that you uh, distill or uh, high frequency information that you can basically just remove in your latent space. And then in your decoder, you can reconstruct this high frequency information that's now like maybe completely different, but to the human eye, it looks exactly the same. And it, like, it doesn't matter. It just has to be coherent. Um, and then yeah, that's fine. And in proteins, there's just no, no such um, high frequency information uh, that we need to, yeah, that we can preserve and then uh, dream up again in the in the decoder, um, or that we can throw away and then dream up again in the decoder. Anyway, just some musings on like what is the actual yeah. dimensionality. Totally, because I think that's a very interesting question and something that we've you know also continuing to think about. I think it's there's. Um, I think if you want to get to a very principled answer, I think you can get 
pretty deep. <laughs> there's a, a lot of different aspects you consider, right? Um, there's also compression with respect to what, right? With respect to backbone atoms only is different than all atoms. And um, like in the theory, this embedding is supposed to carry like an all atom information. Um, even though TM1 is only is evaluating the backbone only information, the angstrom, the RMSD is all atom RMSD and not just yeah. backbone. So that, like I would kind of want a representation like this. Right, uh, like a TM score, um, an LDDT above 0.99, then then I'm fine with the uh, compression. Um, so yeah, like maybe we can say 32 is what we need, and 32 is a lot more than uh, four, or let's say also a lot more than nine if we say. We have like three or ten if we take three backbone atoms. Anyway, we can also look at your experiments here where I think you have like some predictor on top of the Z. You predict stability and then uh, you look at the number of channel dimensions and we see uh, performance deteriorates like almost immediately a little bit and uh, yeah, then gets worse and worse. Um, yeah, anything else that you want to say about your paper? Oh, interpolations. Do you think those are important? Yeah, sort of the smoothness of the latest. Sorry, can I have a question? Yeah, let's go. Um, so if I understood correctly, you said that, especially for some of the functional information like solubility, the number of dimensions um, deteriorates much quicker than if you try to predict, let's say, structure. I'm I'm just wondering because the structures they look almost perfect. Um, even when you deteriorate the number of dimensions to quite quite a small number, so I'm wondering um, how would you explain that these functional changes are so much more affected by it than than the structure? Because I would imagine that those are basically coming from the structure itself. Uh, to yeah. uh, also for the question, Amy, can you clarify if you like retrain the predictor always on the uh, lower dimensional representations? Uh, yeah, uh, you, the, the linear yeah. probe was always retrained, obviously. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. But um, that's a good question. So there's also concurrent work, um, like feature reuse from MSR that comes to mind that also examined that um, it seems like that these language models might, you know, might not capture much more than structure. That's like an open question. Um, one way to think about this is, or at least the way that I think about it is like, imagine if you're compressing an image of like a like a motorcycle or something like that, right? But if the structure is like the shape of the motorcycle, then in some ways it's kind of understandable that that's easier to compress than say like the speed that the motorcycle is going on or like how safe the motorcycle is. Because let's say if you want to predict the speed, then you need to know like the exact motor brand and that's a very specific number of pixels. Um, and, and, you know, I think if you're and also considering the fact that this is, these are all like generalized proteins embeddings, right? So if you're trying to train an imaging presser for all images, it kind of makes sense that you can still retain the shape of the motorcycle, but you kind of like miss the key pixels that are addressing the like name of the motor. And so now that's gone. And so you can't predict the name of the motor as well. And so the, the so it decreases more gradually because the name of the motor, quote unquote, is sort of like dissipating more gradually. Um, so that's that's maybe one intuition that I will put forth, but I think this is like a one of the interesting like open-ended questions that I'm pretty curious about, and yeah, I think would would love to have answers to. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think the the, the motorcycle analogy doesn't hold up. Like, if I have a um, if you have your image of a motorcycle, then you have like hidden stuff you can't look at um like i don't know you can't look at the inside of the motor or so or how it works while if you have your protein then i mean you have the sequence you have the structure then you have everything about the protein and should be able to predict all of its function and there's nothing hidden about it and sure but even if you confine yourself to the set of motorcycle functions that are um 
determinable from the image and without opening up the trunk of the motorcycle, right? Even if you confine yourself, like let's just say the brand, okay? Let's maybe let's like forget the speed of the motorcycle. Let's just say the brand of the motorcycle, right? Like that's a function, quote unquote, of the motorcycle image that you can get from just the image. But if you want to build a generalized compressor of motorcycles, or not even open, just yeah, like of images of motorcycles or something, right? Um, it kind of makes sense that, or like one intuition that could help explain this, right, is that um, the overall shape is a little bit easier to build a generalized model for for compressing, whereas you know, compressing individual words and such is a little bit more difficult. I mean, I would just think about the protein itself then. Um, like we have the, we're saying that maybe to predict the function. Um, like what, 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 what is the part of the protein specifically that causes something to be more or less fluorescent? Yeah, and maybe like the then there are the sort of let's call it low frequency information of where what is the exact relation of the of the atoms and if now the atoms are a little less further apart then the um like then there's no catalytic activity anymore and then yeah if you don't have this or if you your your model always makes the prediction oh yeah, if these atoms are this and that far apart, and this is the motif that I know is the one that catalyzes the reaction. And right. that, that has high fluor fluorescence. Um, <laughs> and if it's, now we don't have this low frequency information of this exact distance that is necessary for this catalyzation. Uh, and then we... Um, yeah, no longer can make this this prediction. So then yeah. maybe the argument would be that for functional predictions, the low frequency information matters, while our TM scores uh, they not they are not able to capture this low frequency um, difference in distances. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's why different, I yeah, I think that's why different functions have different patterns, right? Like you'll see that solubility decreases less than say fluorescence. And I think that, what again, one explanation, I think these are all like hypotheses that, that what I'm saying right now, I mean, what everyone is saying right now are all hypotheses, right? And it's possible that say solubility is one of those functions that, you know, you just kind of have to know like, you know, where the hydrophobic, hydrophilic residues are. And that's a little bit easier to capture with a model that's mostly capturing structure information only. Whereas say like, beta lactamase right like and the active site is pretty small <laughs> relative to the size of the entire protein um, and so if you have a model that is mostly if the assertion is true that plms are mostly capturing structure then you know it makes sense that there are some functions that it should work better for it there's some functions that are easier to compress for and some functions that are harder to compress for okay um then i think that's that's a fair discussion of that area like why does uh, the the stuff here get worse and i discovered my laser pointer sorry for the distraction <laughs> but we have the question from denise um here you have two uh two two shortening factor do you mm -hmm. also have the the results uh, do the results for uh, one shortening factor so for no shortening look the same um, that's a good point. I don't think I have those. I I have some of those for like structure-based tasks. Okay. The short answer is no, but I think, yeah, it would be interesting to run that. That's a great, great suggestion. Um, although these are mean pooled. And so I think the lengthening factor is not so per or yeah, because it's already mean pooled along the length when you put it into the MLP, when you put it into the linear probe, um, like either way it gets mean mean out later anyway okay good then i would say um let's ignore the the latent space interpolation results and um then i would say is there anything that you anything last that you want to point out before we call the day here 
Um, yeah, I know we're already over time. So, <laughs> um, no, I mean, yeah, the, it's, um, I personally, I, I actually think the interrelation results are one of the, like, raises a lot of questions to me, for me, that in terms of, like, what makes for a good latent space, right? Like, do you want it to be smooth across the entire space, but then are in more regions of invalid proteins? Or do you want it to be, like, more sudden jumps, but, like, the entire space is is valid or closer to being valid? Um, that's... Well, if you say that's the last thing we should talk about, then uh, we will uh, do so, I would <laughs> say. And um, that's basically what I wanted to to hear, if you think something else is more important or this. And here, how do we measure smoothness? I think what you do is you have your original structure and you have your final structure. And you look at like the TM score to the original structure. And then we see, uh, oh, there is a, like a, right? We do our interpolation um, with like a hundred steps of having the, the starting latent or between having the starting latent and having the end, end latent. And then sometimes we see like a jump here. And if we right. see a jump like this, then that's not very smooth. Right, right. Um, um, yeah. So... Is it always a jump here, or do you also have some results where it's not a jump? Um, for the ones that I've like, you know, qualitatively looked at, it's a bit hard to, you know, obviously look at all pairwise inter all pairwise, uh, interpolations for a whole yeah. data set. But, um, yeah, this seems fairly common in the experiments, in at least the one that I probed around. Um, yeah, which is interesting because you're linearly changing in the embedding space, but that's not what happens when you map it back to the structure space. And so even though, and, and yeah, and if you look at the naturalness, you know, like most of those are natural, quote unquote, even though you would assume that most of the, you know, the latent space of proteins, like most of the fitness landscape is invalid, which is not what you see um, when you when you sort of do a linear walk in the embedding space. Um, um, I mean, uh, that's what we do expect if we have like this discrete jump here, right? Where we oh, totally. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that like, is that good? Is that a feature or a bug? Yeah. Okay. Uh, like, I, 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 I personally would. I, I'm, I, I'm leaning towards putting that in the bucket of like a bug of the ESM for latent space in terms of like, because we do a lot of experiments now, right? With, um, like using that as a proxy for the fitness landscape. But I think what this is maybe showing is that that might not be the most. Um, but then, it, yeah, like it's overfit to the neighborhood of like existing data points. I guess the second part of this figure, let me make a statement about it and let's see if you agree with the statement. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, what we're observing here is if we have the high dimensional latent space with the pathological uh, sizes, uh, I missed why we need a discrete latent space. Because if we had, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm I'm reading a question from the chat yeah, now. Sorry for yeah. the distraction. I missed why we need a discrete latent space. Because if we had a VAE, it would make it smooth with versus structure. Uh, I I don't know what's the the stuff at the end. Um, just uh, why discrete latent space? So in these interpolations here, right? Uh, we we do have the the VAE latent space, the non-discrete latent space, the continuous one. Is that right? Um, yes, and actually, I don't know if I sure I got fears, what you're saying. No, so in, like, in the, like there, there's a, so this is with respect to the continuous latent space. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there's, in the appendix, there's another one with the discrete latent space, but. But you do also interpolation with a discrete latent space. How does that interpolation work? Uh, it's in the appendix. Um, it's. It's, it's a bit harder to do a linear interpolation there because we don't have a mask token. Um, and so it's a little bit more difficult to be like, what does it mean to do interpolation in a discrete thing space? It's this one right here, the last the last one. Uh, sorry, the very last figure, the last page. Yeah, there we go. No, yeah, but I mean, uh, just how it works. Um, but uh, it's quick to explain, otherwise then let's just ignore. 
yeah I, okay so my 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 read of the question itself is yeah like the the street latent space isn't so much to um smooth this out this the street latent space was more motivated by works in um like tokenized embeddings of images videos and the desire to like reconcile that with lm architecture so yeah so it wasn't necessarily too correct for the latent space but i think it's a good question that so if we want to do this stuff then probably we won't use a discrete latent space but... yeah because it's discrete right <laughs> like you can't yeah. But if we want to do, uh, or why do we want a discrete latent space? So I want one for protein generation, for example, because then I can't just train a language model on discrete right. things and then do DPO uh, and then calculate likelihoods of the structures that I generate. And calculating right. likelihoods of uh, what your generative model generates is very useful for many applications. Um, yeah, especially in science, I would say. Yeah. And then I think the, the second thing about this figure is maybe um, in the non-compressed latent space, what you decode to always sort of makes sense, while in the compressed latent space, the stuff that you decode to sometimes is a jumble before it starts making sense again. Yeah. Okay. Um which is kind of surprising a little bit, I would think, because I would think in the, uh, no, I'm not sure if it's surprising, but uh, we, the compressed latent space should be smoother, right? Yeah, I think it's, again, these are kind of tests of intuitions that are a little bit hard to have a correct answer for. Um, yeah, I was also a little bit surprised, but it's it kind of makes sense post-talk. Like, you know, you are changing the landscape. I think that what's more important here is that in what we're seeing from the top is that the ESM full latent space um, is pretty overfit to the neighborhood of like known proteins. Um, like it's like if you if you walk out from where you started, right? Like instead of having a like a very smooth coverage of the entire fitness landscape, you're actually kind of just overfitting to like your existing. You're kind of just like, oh, I'm walking, but I'm still in the original training data, and then oh, I jump to the next training data. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not like a yeah. smooth walk. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's maybe the main takeaway from this experiment that I like saw. Um, yeah, like I don't think this is necessarily highlighting. Well, I don't know. Maybe it is having the strength of cheap. It's unclear, right? Like maybe you do want a latent space where, you know, most of it is jumbo because most of the latent space is jumbo, right? So. Okay, and I see a camera turned back on. Does it imply yeah. another question? Let's go. Yes, it does. So I was wondering, um, in both of those two latent spaces. If you moved from one protein just slightly away, so not towards the other protein, but just mm. slightly away, would you first step on a protein that looks a bit similar to it? Or might be there proteins together, like a patchwork yeah. of, of different things that are completely unrelated in, in neighboring regions of the latent space? That is a great question. I actually had a figure that I didn't put in um, that maybe I should have, but, but sorry, the point being is that, um, yeah, that's one of the one of the good things about the compressed latent space is when you, um, like I tried experiments adding cosine noise with a diffusion schedule onto the, um, onto the uncompressed versus the compressed. Um, if you put it into the uncompressed, it basically like, yeah, like what I said, like even though you're adding Gaussian noise gradually, it kind of stays the same and it has a very sudden drop. Whereas it's a bit more smoother um, when you're changing it into like noise. Um, but I haven't done, yeah, basically the experiments I've run are taking random blocks towards like adding Gaussian noise and linear interpolations. Um, does that does that sort of answer your question or? I, I don't think so. So I was asking is like, if you start with a protein with a lot of, let's say um, beta, beta sheets, and then you moved slightly away from it, would you expect to get a protein that has a lot of beta sheets, uh, sheets or would you expect something that has a lot of coil structure? I mean, in a sense that when you walk, when you move slightly, the protein structure that you're getting um, decoded from that region of the light and space is completely different or similar. So like, I think before you get some, if you have something that has a lot of sheets, and then you uh, add some noise to it um, uh, before you get something that has a lot of coils. You, so you will not get something that has a lot of coils. You will get 
jumbo. You will get a structure that doesn't make sense. Okay, so yeah, maybe I didn't explain quite well. So would you expect that all of the proteins that have, let's say, a lot of beta sheets are together in some region of the latent space and all of those that have a different structure and multi will be in a different region? Or are they kind of interdispersed? So you have a lot, some beta sheets here, some beta sheets here, some coils here, some coils here, here, and some other motifs all around? Or are they like, you know, the usual structure we would yeah. see often in latent spaces and some function is here and another function is here and another function is here? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say what an idealized latent space should look like, right? Because like, what do we know about the high dim dimensionalities, the, the high dimensional geometry of protein space? Like, if we're not, human brain is not conceptual, like, made to conceptualize about that. But I would say that I prefer having a latent space where it's not grouped by, like, secondary st structure patterns, because that's not as interesting as function or just, like, a more general notion of protein similarity aside from just structure, right? Like evolution would be really cool, but that's maybe a tall order for a, for a, like a man-made geometric latent space of proteins. I love anyone okay, else thank you. wants to weigh in on this, but that would be maybe my, um, my take on it. All right, then, um... Any other questions, then then keep, then let's get to them quickly. Unmute yourself. Otherwise, we'll probably end this soon here. Because, Amy, any last words that you want to say before we finish? Um, no, I mean, yeah, I'm glad that, you know, the questions were all great. Discussion was great. Um, yeah, the um, mediation was great. So, yeah. Perfect. Then let's say uh, an end here for the official part or whatever and bye everyone friends of the sun uh hope to see you next week and next week we will probably discuss like glm2 and the omg data set like some genomic language model stuff and yeah we'll we'll see about that um hopefully that will be interesting you can join that one as well and so see you around for that friends of the sun bye have a great day and amy you're flying back tomorrow yes yeah oh, good then ha have a safe trip and yeah the hiking stuff it's not clear yet what we'll do this weekend uh, probably we'll do something with some um some other nvidia people and okay. i have the high suspicion it will be somewhere in marin county do you have a car i do have a car okay then you could just drive over this bridge and then the other bridge and then uh, <laughs> join our hike. And yeah. probably afterward, we'll go to like Lolinda for uh, for some dinner stuff. So it would probably be like Saturday, um, Saturday start at noon, finish at six or so, and then uh, go for dinner. Uh, like it, it will be more of a three hour hike thing, not, not something super long. Um, yeah. Just this yeah, time. No, that's great. Yeah, always down for a hike in Marin. Okay, I'll keep you updated about that. Um, but then, yeah, bye to you as well, and bye All to right, everyone. See you. All right, take care. Bye.